Hi, this is Dr. Chen Wen Liu. Thank you for choosing me for performing your hip replacement surgery. I thought I'd make this little video just to guide you through a little bit about what we spoke about in the rooms, as I understand that it can be a little bit daunting at times to go through all of those details in that time. Firstly, to go over how I performed the surgery. Like we spoke about in the rooms, you'll be aware that I perform all of my total hip replacements using direct anterior approach. What that means is that we access your hip from the front with an incision approximately this long, where we do not cut or detach any of the muscles or tendons to place the prosthesis inside your body. This is still a total hip replacement and we perform this using patient-specific technology. Patient-specific technology is something where a three-dimensional scan is performed prior to the surgery. If you have already booked in your date, you would already have a time to have this scan so that we can perform your surgery many weeks on our computer before you actually undergo the operation in the operating theater. A three-dimensional scan is performed where a three-dimensional block is constructed. It also enables me to simulate your entire surgery so that when it comes time for the surgery, there are no issues with us knowing what anatomy we're going to get and what things we may encounter during the operation. The actual operation itself is something that takes roughly 45 minutes to 60 minutes. Most of our patients will undergo a spinal anesthetic. A spinal anesthetic is a small needle that is placed into the back along with an anesthetic so that you are not aware of what we do during the surgery. Now this may range from you being awake to you being put to sleep and a variety of different levels in between. Our anaesthetist will speak to you before the surgery to go over this. After the surgery, once the spinal wears off, you'll first start to be able to wiggle your toes. And then as the day progresses, you'll be able to move the legs around as you see fit. Because we are performing the surgery without cutting or detaching any muscle, there is no requirement for you to stay in one position or to have a pillow strap between your legs after the surgery. The risk of dislocation is significantly less with this procedure than with the traditional approaches that I used to perform. After the operation, our physios will attend to you in the afternoon to get you up and walking so that we can test to see how you feel putting a bit of weight through that leg. This is not a deal breaker or a definite requirement to achieve a great result, but it certainly speeds up your recovery if we can see that you can move nicely on that first day of surgery. After that, you'll certainly be progressed through a series of gentle exercises with the main focus being swelling control and safe mobility. A walking frame is generally used for the first day or two and a walking stick is then used for a several weeks. The walking stick is not something that you need to rely upon, but should be carried with you to ensure that you do not fall or trip over unexpected objects during your early recovery. I would prefer if you didn't drive for the first couple of weeks until we've had the chance to review things in person or over the phone for your first post-operative visit. That just enables us to make sure that you're walking reasonably well and that you're not taking the heavy pain medications. In terms of pain medications after the surgery, we have several pain medication levels. In general, we'd like to place you on Panadol. Panadol or paracetamol is something that we use just to help reduce the level of generalized discomfort. It is a fantastic analgesic, but obviously doesn't help when the pain gets worse. You will require something stronger generally after the surgery for a few days, but we usually will not require you to be on it for long term. We'd like to slow down the pain medication after the first few days to only taking it as you require. And most people will find that night times are the most uncomfortable when you are resting after a long day of exercise. There are risks with any procedure. The general risks of surgery include bleeding, blood clots and infection. We will be giving you several things to decrease those risks. For bleeding, most of our patients will get an intravenous injection of a particular substance called tranexamic acid. It is a very safe product that has been used in many, many people that we use routinely for all of our hip and knee replacement patients to reduce the general body's response to bleeding. A secondary part of this is the spinal anesthetic. 
spinal anesthetics for hip replacements have shown to decrease the risk of intraoperative and postoperative bleeding. And we use that as a way to minimize the amount of bleeding that you have throughout your procedure and the postoperative period. During surgery, we have a special device called an Aquamantis, which is a cooled coagulator that goes through and reduces the surface bleeding of any of the very small blood vessels that come about. But typically speaking, you will still have some bruising around the wound that can sometimes go down and track under the skin down the leg. This is not something that you need to be too concerned about as it will almost all disappear by the two week mark. Blood clots are another potential risk and something that we take very seriously. Now, a blood clot is something that is extremely rare and certainly extremely rare to cause a full body issue like a pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary embolism is something that develops when the blood clot from the legs travel up to the lungs. We give you three things to reduce the risk of deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms. The first of those things is generally, for most of our patients, a pharmaceutical agent called aspirin. Aspirin is a very common medication that we give in two doses a day for approximately four weeks after the surgery. For some of you who have pre-existing issues that may preclude you from taking aspirin, or if you are on a stronger medication such as warfarin, Xarelto, or Apixaban, a specific set of anticoagulation instructions will be given to you after the surgery as guided by our physicians. The second thing that we do is TED stockings. TED stockings are a white stocking that we place on your leg that help to compress the calf to reduce the amount of swelling that occurs in the calf. This has been shown to reduce the risk of DVT and it also allows the swelling to be significantly reduced after the surgery in that region. I would recommend using these on both legs for the duration of your postoperative period up until two weeks postoperatively. Some of our patients will feel like the TED stockings are a bit uncomfortable. They are meant to be a little bit firm. However, if you do feel that they are a struggle to get on and off, especially after you've been in the shower and you don't have someone that can help you put them on and off, then it is certainly fine to not wear those if it is a big issue. But they are an element of that risk reduction for deep venous thrombosis. The third thing that we use are foot pumps. You will notice that the night that you wake up, you'll have some foot pumps that pump the feet and simulate walking. Walking is one of the biggest preventers of blood clots. And by having the foot pumps on, it significantly reduces the risk of deep venous thrombosis. There is a very wide range of comfort levels with these foot pumps where some people really enjoy them and they feel like the most fantastic um, foot massage and some people really dislike them as they keep them awake from the movement overnight. It is quite important for us to have the foot pumps for after the surgery and for that first night. Thereafter, if you're mobilizing reasonably well, then we can take them off when you wish to sleep, if you required. The next potential complication is infection. Infection rate for us is extremely low. Part of this is our vigilance during surgery and our techniques and procedures that are put in place as we have a very refined ability to ensure that infection risk is very low. This comes down from the entire team, from the first person that opens the trays to how we prepare the skin and perform the surgery to our nurses after the surgery. The wound is something that we take very seriously and has several layers before it gets to the outside air. At the end of the procedure, I will be completing the skin suture using a dissolvable skin stitch that sits underneath the skin. This will not need to be removed and dissolves roughly six to 12 weeks after the surgery. On top of that layer, there is a layer of glue. That glue is placed over the top of the suture that enables this to seal the wound so that nothing can get in. Occasionally, the seal is not complete and that's certainly not of major concern because we do want any excess bleeding to come through the wound and rather than staying under the skin. The glue is an antibacterial glue and that usually will come off at the time of your two week appointment along with the rest of the dressing. Overlying the glue are several steri strips to hold the wound together to enable a very thin white line to be the end result once you've fully healed. Over the top of that is a white indicator strip. 
after your surgery, you'll see the white indicator strip and that just tells us how much bleeding, if any, is coming through the dressing. The white indicator strip can't hold a lot of fluid or blood. So if it does get full, that's an indicator for you to contact me and let me know what's happening. On top of that is the waterproof dressing, which is a special dressing that enables some of the, uh, some of the sweating and the fluid to come out through the skin and nothing to get in. However, we would prefer if you did not have a bath after the surgery until the dressing comes off and for you to avoid things like aquaerobics or hydrotherapy for one month after the procedure. This dressing is something that can get wet. However, try not to let the water from the shower hit directly onto the dressing as it will degrade over time and water can then get underneath the dressing between the skin folds. You certainly can have a normal shower, but just don't let the water hit directly onto the dressing. Further risks of surgery are very rare. They include things like dislocation, fracture, and damage to nerves and blood vessels. Dislocation is something that we really don't think too much about in this approach, but it certainly is possible. This means that putting your leg into very extreme positions in the early phase of your recovery is certainly something that we'd like to avoid. However, normal day-to-day -day movements that you would do on an everyday basis are certainly uh, able to be done with absolutely no restrictions. Fracture is something that may or may not occur during surgery or could occur if you had a big fall after the operation. If you feel like it's very difficult to put full weight through that leg and that is not improving at a rapid rate, then please let me know as we will need to investigate that. It certainly is not something that is very common, but if you do have any concerns regarding this, it's best to reach out early to let me know. The next potential complication is damage to nerves and blood vessels. One of the big benefits of this approach is that we do not come close to the femoral or sciatic nerves of the body. These are the main two nerves that promote and supply the muscles of the lower leg with motion, as well as sensory innovation to the lower leg. The sciatic nerve is the one that you may read about mostly associated with total hip replacements. It sits posteriorly at the back of the hip, but is something that is not part of the operation that you are about to have. The sciatic and femoral nerves are always preserved with this procedure and it would be extremely, extremely rare if they were damaged. The only nerve that is potentially at risk during a direct anterior approach for the hip replacement is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. It supplies the lateral aspect of the thigh and in, in some cases you may find that there is a small patch of numbness that arises below the wound. The benefit of this nerve being the one that's only at risk is that it only supplies the skin and does not supply any muscular innovation. So function and mobility and strength can never be damaged if that nerve is stretched or damaged in any way. If you do wake up with a small numb patch next to the thigh, please do not worry because often that's just due to the stre stretch of the surgery and you'll find that that will recover over the next three months. A hip replacement is a fantastic procedure. When we look at longevity of a hip replacement, the hip replacements that we have now are certainly different to those from decades ago. And often we hear people saying, doesn't a hip replacement only last 10 to 15 years? And certainly that may have been the case decades ago, but from the literature in the Australian Joint Registry, which looks at every single hip replacement that has been performed over the last 20 years since it started, has shown that the rate of revision for all hip replacements is approximately one in 10 people at the 20 year mark. That translates to a nine out of 10 survival of hip replacements at 20 years, which is fantastic when we look at how far things have come over the last two decades. I perform almost all my hip replacements using ceramic on ceramic as the articulation of choice. This has the benefit of being a very inert substance where the body does not see the ceramic as something of a foreign body. The ceramic on ceramic is a hard on hard bearing surface that has extremely good wear properties and is something that I'm extremely experienced and familiar with as it has gone through many iterations over decades to be a combination of zirconia and alumina. 
This means that fracture of ceramics is unheard of these days, but could occur if you were in a major accident. I hope you remember some of these things from when we spoke about them in the rooms. If not, feel free to let me know exactly what your queries and concerns are. You can always contact me by sending me an email or calling our rooms and we'll be in touch throughout the journey to ensure that you're aware of all the things that you need to do leading up into surgery. From myself and the rest of the team, I wish you a very calm lead up to the surgery and please feel free, like I said, to reach out to me if you have any queries or concerns. Thanks again for choosing me to perform your hip replacement and I can't wait to get you up and walking and forgetting that you even have had a hip replacement. Thank you.